Good afternoon. I'm Mark Greenfield. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I would like to welcome you to the third program in our fall lecture series. Today's speaker has been a labor member of parliament for 10 years. One of his most notable achievements was a telegram of protest he initiated and was signed by over 100 members of parliament, which was sent to Lyndon Johnson condemning U.S. intervention in Vietnam. Mr. Orem is an expert in foreign policy, and it is in this regard that he has come today. We've had some kind of a conflict, and the coalition had also planned to discuss moratorium plans. So Mr. Orem has agreed that to the latter part of his address at about 12.30, he'll discuss the moratorium and then take question and answers in that regard, and we'll turn the program over to the coalition for their discussion of the events of Thursday and Friday. I introduce to you Mr. Stanley Orm. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, I'm very pleased to be at this university in California today. I don't know whether it's appropriate or not, but um, I'm in California talking about the war in Vietnam. Governor Reagan is in London. I don't know if he's telling them what marvelous students that you, he has in California, but he's certainly talking about the, uh, the war in Vietnam. And I don't know whether his priorities are the same as mine, but I want to talk about the British position in relation to this war because Britain has a special consideration and a special position and British support, the British government's support since 1964 for the American action in Vietnam in many ways has been very decisive for the American action. When a Labour government was elected in 1964 in Britain we look forward to a change of socialist action in Britain, a stepping up of the changing of our society, and at the same time we look for a different approach to the foreign, foreign policy issues uh, which had been developing in the late 50s and the early 60s. In fact, it was the intention of the Labour government to make defence policy subservient to foreign policy where it always ought to be as far as I'm concerned. And therefore, as a socialist in the British Parliament, we look forward to some basic changes in British policy. This was not only felt desirable in Britain, but people throughout the world seeing a socialist government return, look forward with a heightened interest to a different approach by Great Britain. I know this to be a fact because I've traveled widely in Europe, in the Middle East, and in Africa, and I know that the return of a Labour government brought hopes uh, that some of the international situations which had been so hard in the past that a different approach by a Labour government uh, might bring basic changes. Well, we had a Labour government in Britain. We had a socialist government from October the 15th, 1964 until November the 21st, 1964, when the first run on the pound started, created by external forces in Britain, which created a monetary crisis within our, within our country, and remembering that Britain is an international banker, that sterling is the second major currency in the world after the dollar, and used as a trading currency, and remembering that Britain still had a large measure of troops and bases, not only in Europe, but the Middle East and in the Far East, this crisis put Britain in a difficult situation. 
She, should, she could have either cut back immediately some of these international commitments, she could have had a ch basic change of policy, or she could try and get through with the support of international financiers and bankers. I'm under no illusion at all that the Washington administration underwrote support for the American pound in return for the support of American foreign policy overseas. I'm under no illusion about this whatsoever. That support for American foreign policy overseas, of course, meant support for the war in Vietnam. And despite all our efforts in the United Kingdom, we have been unable to move the Brit British government from this basic support. I only need to tell you this, that it is a known fact, and you as Americans know it probably as well as I do, that when President Johnson was finally was pushed into a corner during the difficult days he had during this war, his last two lines of defense were the Gulf of Tonkin resolution which he always carried in his wallet and which he produced. <laughs> and the other point was that he had the support of America's major ally, and what more? It had a socialist government and a socialist prime minister. I know from Americans that have visited Britain, I know that when I visited the United States in uh, two years ago, and when my colleagues and I at that particular time had breakfast one morning with Dean Rusk, he was as quick to thrust this down our throats as other people that we met in the administration. And therefore, we've had this difficulty. And we had this difficulty as we saw the war escalate. And be under, let's be under no illusion. This war has escalated under three presidents. And the first president to create that escalation was J.F. Kennedy. It was then followed by Lyndon Johnson and is now being carried on by President Nixon. But we were not silent on this issue. Even though it was our government, even though it was our administration that was supporting the Americans. We organized within Parliament. We fought campaigns. We discussed this in the trade union movement. And I might say here that I am a trade unionist. I represent in Parliament a major, the second largest trade union in Great Britain, namely the Engineering Union, and we have 17 sponsored members in the British House of Commons. We fought in the trade union movement, we fought in the Labour Party for a change of policy. And in the actual fact, within those organisations, we have an affected such a change of policy. Two and a half years ago, the British Labour Party came out overwhelmingly against support for American policy in Vietnam. And the Trade Union Congress, representing 9 million trade unionists, came out in, in, in exactly the same manner. We then fought this issue in Parliament. And, in, it was, and as you, as if you talk to congressmen and senators here, it's not always easy to get these issues discussed if the administration don't want you to discuss them, particularly in a situation where you might want to force this to a vote. But two years ago, in 1967, a group of colleagues and myself, who were successful in a ballot in the British Parliament for a discussion of any issue we wished to ch uh, choose, put down the issue of Vietnam, forced a debate in the British Parliament. The Tories, the Conservative Party in Britain, supported the British government because they've there is no dissent in the British Conservative Party. There is not one member of the British Conservative Party on record in opposition to this war in Vietnam. And in consequence, when we had the debate, at the end of the debate, we forced a division, a vote in the House of Commons, and I and 62 colleagues of mine voted against our own government in support of the official policy of our own party and the Trade Union Congress. This is what we did in the British Parliament. At the same time, 
throughout this period, the students in Britain, and not only in Britain, but throughout Western Europe, campaigned on this issue because they see this as a moral issue, not just affecting the United States or United States troops in Vietnam, but they see it of a, of a far extending issue affecting the fact that a white power is in a colored country, that they are trying to form a, a form of dominance within Southeast Asia. They saw it that if we were to bring an end to s such conflicts that exist in a very difficult world, until the Vietnam War was ended, there was no chance of having any change of basic policy whatsoever. Because this war is not only poisoning the atmosphere in Vietnam, it's poisoning the minds of men and women throughout this world. It's cheapening life. It's making issues like Nigeria and the Middle East and Europe seem insignificant whilst a war is being waged and fought and thousands of lives being lost. And it's in this situation that the students campaigned and demonstrated, and you must have heard of the Grosvenor Square demonstrations and the students that turned out in the tens of thousands. All right, we got the same issues, the same ridicule, the students were criticized. All right, some of the students were irrational, some of them were irresponsible, but nevertheless the vast majority campaigned for an end to this war and in consequence made their mark, I believe, on the British public. And when I've been abroad and I've spoken on this issue and on nuclear weapons, I've spoken in West Germany, in Berlin, I've spoken to the students at the Free University in Berlin, I spoke to the students in France. I marched in Greece from, the, from Marathon into Greece, 26 miles, when the, when the streets were lined with troops as we arrived, whereas a half a million people arrived in Greece prior to the takeover uh, of the colonels and the, and the form of fascism that's now been implanted in that country. I marched with the Greek people who gave the word democracy to this world, I marched with them and, other, and in many other places as well. And the same feeling and desire exists. And I do not accept this philosophy that the war is inevitable, that this war can't be fought other than in the most dastardly means. I believe, and I want to say something about this in a minute, that there are other ways of tackling this particular issue. But when one looks at this issue, I've often been asked, I've been asked what since I've been here. Well, why are you particularly against American intervention against the war in Vietnam? This is an American issue. American troops are fighting and dying there. Well, I can't take a stand, as I do as a socialist, against the Smith regime in Rhodesia or the Forster regime in South Africa. I can't take a stand against the colonels and the Greek regime in Athens. I can't take a stand in favor of those Czech communists and Duke Czech who opposed the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. I can't stand, take a stand for democracy in Northern Ireland and the ending of the subjugation of the Roman Catholics if at the same time I do not take a stand against the war in Vietnam as well. One cannot have two-sided democracy or two-sided approach to this, this particular problem. And I'd like to say in regard to this issue of Czechoslovakia, I was in Czechoslovakia just a matter of weeks before the Soviet occupation. I'd been in Czechoslovakia several times before the January Declaration and before Dubček assumed responsibility of the, in that country. But I saw there a change in a communist country, a form of democracy. I saw the basic issues in a society changing. I saw the abolition of censorship, which must be, which must be one of the first rules within any free society. I saw the desire for the creation of independent parties. I saw the desire 
of the students to be free to le learn and read what they desired under any conditions. I spoke to the students at Charles University in Prague, I, and, they, and it was the students in Prague who were the first to make the march into Prague, which set in motion many of the factors that allowed uh, Dupček to come uh, to power in that country. And I saw this issue developing, and I read Dupček's speech to the plenary session, in which he talked not of centralism, but of democratic socialism being developed within that country. And this would have had an effect not only in Eastern Europe, but would have come westwards and would have had an effect upon political parties throughout Western Europe and probably far beyond. And if the Soviet Union think they can crush that, they were as much mistaken as if the Americans think that they can crush the Vietnamese people and put them into the straitjacket and into a form of policy that suits the administration here. They are as wrong on that as any form of occupation that has ever existed in the history of mankind. No, op <laughs> no occupation has ever succeeded. It doesn't matter if it lasts a thousand years. In the end, it's got to go. And uh, therefore, these are the sort of issues that, that, that we're faced with. Now, I come to the United States to talk about the issue of the, of the war. I come supported, as I've told you, by the policy of the Labour Party and the Trade Union Congress. I bring with me a message signed by 70 British members of the House of Commons, which says we the November is headed November moratorium. We, the undersigned members of the British Parliament, send our best wishes to the American people who are demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. We applaud the courage of the people who recognize that this war must be brought to an end and that American forces must be withdrawn and a settlement arrived at along the lines originally propounded in the 1954 Geneva Agreement. That's the message that I bring from 70 of my colleagues in the British House of Commons. And I can tell you that the speech of the President, which he made last week and which I heard before I came to this country, was greeted in Britain with utter dismay. And we do not accept that there are no alternatives between the choice of drop everything and run and the choice of continuing the war and possibly escalating it. I believe that there is a chance of a negotiated settlement which will allow the Vietnamese people to take over their own country, form their own government, free of foreign interference of any troops whatsoever or any foreign bases. What are the Paris peace talks are ab about? I was interested what Joseph Kraft said in the Los Angeles Times yesterday in an article which I would recommend everybody to read in the sense where he points out that the people at the Paris peace talks do desire a form of negotiated settlement which will allow the Americans to withdraw, which will allow the form of regime in the South until unification can be brought about, which would stop the slaughter of the, of the Vietnamese who, who, if the Viet Cong took over. Of course, there's a much more simple answer to that. If the Ameri those in America that are worried about the supporters of Saigon, well, of course, they, it would be much cheaper to bring them to the United States than spend the money that they're doing at the moment in fighting the war in Vietnam. But, of course, those same people mightn't like these Vietnamese coming into the United States. <laughs> they certainly wouldn't fit the George Wallace uh, uh, screening. Uh, whether they'd fit anybody else, I don't know. But in this regard, I spoke to the negotiators in Paris, both the North Vietnam and the NLF representatives who are at these peace talks, and I spoke to them only a matter of 10 days ago. And I do know that they are prepared to nego negotiate such a settlement. But how can they trust? How can they, in this situation, where the candidate that fought against 
President Key is now in prison because he happened to mention the pe word peace and wanted to talk to the North Vietnamese. How can we, when we see this rotten government that exists in Saigon, that excludes most of the Buddhists and the Roman Catholics, which has no broad base whatsoever, which only wants the war to be maintained because it, to them they've now developed a form of life out of this war that's been going on so long that it's the wheels that really oils the economy and, and prevents them worrying about other problems. This is the situation uh, that exists, friends, in Vietnam today. And I would say to you in this country that are campaigning against this war we in Britain have nothing but admiration for the American people. Those of us in the Labour Party that take this stand were often called anti-American. I believe it is us that are the pro-Americans. It is, it is us that wants to see this nation free from the criticism that it receives throughout the world. It is us that wants to see the American nation with its great wealth and its technology developed to help not only its own people, but to help the, uh, the two-thirds of the world that are still living in starvation at the present time. It is not us that are, are anti-American. It is the Americans that would gain if they left Vietnam in prestige throughout the world. It is the people in the world and the people that I meet, tens of thousands of them, ordinary people, I find in the main are not the hawks for the continuation of the war in Vietnam, they are the people that want to see this war ended. So who wants to keep the war going? These are the sort of questions that we've got to ask at the present time. And therefore, those of you, whilst a country is at war, your own country, have the courage and guts to stand up and campaign against it, not in the hundreds or the thousands, but now in the millions, is something unique in democratic history in this country, in, in the world. And I think, I think, and I can tell you quite frankly, that this is recognized throughout Western Europe. A thrill ran through the British people when we saw the results of the October the 15th moratorium. We felt that the American people were really saying what they wanted to do, what, what changes of policy they wanted. I don't know about the silent majority. I've never known anybody that supported the war being very silent in America. I found them extremely noisy indeed. But I think the majority of those of the, of the people that stood up, the thinking people, the people that were, are prepared to act. But I would say, and the, and the efforts at the moment of the administration to try and, as it were, dampen down the demonstration at a weekend with the thoughts that there might be trouble and violence and so on, is an indication I would say to you that you are winning and that you must strengthen and redouble your efforts and that there must be that many people out on the streets on Saturday that it won't matter if there are one or two that are creating problems. They will neither be noticed nor seen. It will be the American people recording their verdict on this particular war and calling for the end of such a war. And it's in those terms that I come to the United States. It's in those terms, in, my, in our way, which is as easy for us to criticize when we're not directly involved, but at least to show that to the American people that there are people of similar views throughout the world who are prepared to come here, who are prepared to march with you, who are prepared to demonstrate, and who are prepared, like myself, to go back and tell the British people what the truth is about this war, to go back and say in the British Parliament what we believe is wrong about this war, and to say why we believe that the British government should break its support for American policy, that the, that the, that the British government should have the courage and the guts to stand up and dissociate itself from American policy, to say that we're not going to align ourselves with Spain and South Africa and Portu Portugal, who are the main supporters of this policy in, in Western Europe, and to say to you that there are millions of people who want to see the end to this war, want to see the end to what is happening in Vietnam, want to see these 
brave people allowed to conduct their own lives, perhaps to fall out amongst themselves, but it certainly doesn't behove any nation to implant 500,000 troops on the soil and try to put, implant also an alien conception what they don't want and which they've proved they've not, they've not wanted. They've not wanted since the time that the Chinese, the Japanese, the French and the Americans, they'll all come and they'll all go and the Vietnamese people will survive and the sufferers will be those that have put their sons into the field and have lost them in the bloody battle. Lost them for what? For no basic gain whatsoever. This is the situation that exists at the moment. And therefore I would say to you friends that I believe that what you are doing is important not only for America but for the world. I believe that what you are doing will bear fruit. I believe that the young people in this world don't want tyranny, don't want oppression, don't want democ uh, dictatorship, that they want democracy. And I don't care whether those young people are in the United States, in Britain, in West Germany, in Eastern Europe, or in the Middle East, or in Asia or Africa. I believe they want the same things and the same aspirations. But you've got to stand up and fight for it. It will not come easily. You know, the chances are here now. I hope that this campaign against this war will bring an end. And I want to finish on this note, Mr. President. It is this. A colleague of mine has just recently returned. He only came back last week from Vietnam. He is a member of the British Parliament. He is a well-known lecturer. He's visited the United States many times. His name is Colin Jackson. He was in South Vietnam. He was shown all the battle areas. He told me that flying over the Delta, where the B-23s have been bombing, that it looked as uh, just the same. The whole foliage had gone, and it was just looked like the moon with the pit marks of the bombs and so forth. And whilst he was in Saigon, he didn't talk to Mr. Bunker, who is the, who is the ambassador there, but he talked to possibly the second highest official in Saigon, the American official. And this official said to him, when he was discussing it, look, Mr. Jackson, there is only one factor that can stop the United States pursuing this war to what we consider should be a victory in Vietnam. That factor is public opinion in the United States. Take that message to its obvious conclusion. You can end this war. I wish you every success and I wish this great nation a great future. Thank you very much. We'll take a few minutes of question and answers, and I think, Mr. Orm, you can just call on your questioners yourself, all right? Well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, but until we end wars, or at least minimize them to the extent that they're completely insignificant, only then can we start ar arguing this philosophy that there should be no war at all. I think if we, took a, if we took a vote on it, we would all say unanimously that we're against war. But there are certain situations that one gets put into, and I, personally, I'm not a pacifist. I fought against fascism in the Second World War uh, and therefore under those circumstances it's to create the world, the right type of world, which makes war unnecessary. I agree, I agree, yes.
Um, well, I discussed this matter with the Vietnamese, but I want to sort of not just use my words because I have no documentary evidence to, 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 to prove this, but I would refer you to what Mr. Kraft said, which is in, I, I, I only read this article yesterday, I had no idea he was going to read it, but he said he, was, he talked to Mr. Saintney, who is obviously the gentleman that President Nixon sent to see Ho Chi Minh, he is a confidant of the president. He was also a friend of Ho Chi Minh. And when he said, I saw St. Day at the end of September, just after his return from the funeral of Ho Chi Minh in Hanoi, he'd had a long talk with Premier Pham Van Dong. He was persuaded that the other side was prepared to accept a settlement that would include an independent and non-communist South Vietnam set in a neutralist Southeast Asia. I've talked to the Vietnamese and they've told me exactly the same. For ultimately, they want a unified Vietnam as laid down in the 1954 Geneva Agreement. But this will have to work its way through when conditions are normalized within that country. A step, steps to normalize the situation could be taken at the Paris peace talks and such a, an agreement could be underwritten not by American troops but by international agreement which could therefore be binding on all sides. A situation where you would have a broad government which would have a period to work itself in, which the Saigon government and the Viet Cong would as in effect cease the fighting. That doesn't mean at one particular time they might eventually go communist or they might go uh, in another direction. But the fact is it is possible and we've got to remember that these Vietnamese, now having been fighting for 20 to 25 years, want to see an end to this war. The only condition that they will not accept is that it be Vietnamized, as the President has said. What an ugly and disgusting word that is, to Vietnamize a war. In other words, bring home American forces, or at least a large part of them, but supply the arms, the weapons, the planes, the guns, so that, this, so that the Saigon government can carry on the fight. So I say to you, and we must not forget this, the Paris peace talks have been forgotten. Remember what Avril Harriman has said, who was president, present there as President Johnson's negotiator. He has said that there is a possibility of achieving agreement at these talks. That doesn't mean a perfect agreement, but it would mean agreement which would give us a broadly based government, which would give us a form of society which would stop the massacre of the people that some, that, you know, people are concerned about, and it would lead to the, to the end of this war. I believe that that's possible. I think this article underwrites it. Well, to have free elections in such a context are very difficult. As you know, the elections that were held recently when, uh, w during the American occupation were completely unsuccessful and undemocratic. What I am saying is that a form of po possibly coalition government leading to elections could be the prerequisite to the point that we're making. Yes? Well, I, I, I'm always prepared to give, you know, the benefit of the doubt to people, and if he says he wants peace in Vietnam, I'm prepared to accept it. The only thing is, he's going in exactly the wrong direction to achieve it. The question of the talk of the withdrawal of American forces is a false HUD at the moment, because though forces have been withdrawn from, from Vietnam, other forces, w which we're not told about, have replaced those forces that have come back. So I would say that in relation to what the President has said, if he thinks he can achieve peace, and by peace he means, he doesn't mean ending the war, he means Vietnamizing the war, if that is his conception, well I'm saying that it, not only is it wrong, it's immoral, and what's more will not be accepted by the Vietnamese people. Yes?
my part to help in this war, and which is one of the reasons why a lot of people are here. So I wonder if it would be possible, there's going to be a, a sort of a meaning to, to take some positive action about this if we could if we could be, begin pretty soon, because a lot of people have classes very soon, and like if we want to do something besides talk, we have to start working. Yeah, well, look, I'm... I, I, I'm a doer, I, I, quite frankly, in many ways, I'm a doer rather than a talker in this action. I accept your point. Could, could we perhaps, uh, I, I'm, I'm in your hands. I mean, this is your meeting. I, I'm, I, I, I'm not running it in any sense at all. Um, could we perhaps take a couple of questions and then we finish? Right. Yes. Oh, well, I don't, you see, I don't accept this. You see, the, the, the war in Vietnam was escalated to meet the dullest philosophy of the domino theory. That in actual fact, you must stop it somewhere, otherwise it would end up in, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I don't accept this whatsoever, because where this is completely misguided is the idea that we're f fighting an amorphous communist system. In actual fact, as we know from very recent experience, this system is very much divided. And in actual fact, if we'd have had an independent Vietnam, and as President Eisenhower said in 1956, he couldn't allow the elections, because if they'd have had free elections in 1956, Ho Chi Minh would have won the elections throughout the country. That, that was why support was given to DM. Now look, if there had been an independent Vietnam, it would, may have been a communist Vietnam, but it would not have been a servant of, of either Peking or of Moscow. You know, these nationalist re revolutions, in many cases, are more nationalist than socialist or communist. People want independence, they want their own country, they want to, de to, 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 to develop it, and they'll not have any interference, whether it's coming from Washington, Peking, or Moscow. So the point is this, that the Vietnamese people must be allowed to decide for themselves. <clears throat> there, is no two, there is no two ways around this. And in consequence, you know, the more the Americans try to persuade them otherwise, the more they push. Do you know what, the, what, what this policy is doing? It's driving out the doves in Vietnam and putting the hawks in their position. This is, this is one of the, the unfortunate situations that's developed. So therefore, the sooner it ends, the better. And I do not accept that in our society there is such a thing as a domino theory. Because if I can come back to the Soviet Union, they were frightened of Czechoslovakia taking an independent line to the communist bloc in Western Europe. Because everything's divided up in spheres of influence, Soviet sphere, Chinese sphere, American sphere, one gets the impression that one can do what one wants in each sphere. And in fact, the Americans can go into Santo Domingo if they want. The Russians can go into Czechoslovakia. This is a misconception of dividing the world up on a false philosophy. Because Czechoslovakia will demand its independence as much as any banana state in South America will do in the future. And they will, nothing will stop it. And therefore, I do not accept this domino theory. I think you, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to this young lady.